Victoria hopes to encourage open conversation by sharing her experiences and counter tactics she's found helpful in combating negative patterns of thinking, a common phenomenon of imposter syndrome. Welcome, Victoria. Thanks, Angie. Can you see my slides? Yes. Awesome. As you now know, my name is Victoria. I am a software engineer at Confluent working on the event streaming database KSQL DB. My freshman year of high school, I somehow made it onto the varsity tennis team where I was the worst player by a noticeable margin. I was frustrated with my performance and didn't enjoy the sport as a result. I also felt out of place on the team since my teammates had all been playing for many years, whereas I'd only learned recently. I felt like I was pretending to be someone I wasn't. After a particularly rough practice session where it seemed as if less than half my shots went in, I shared my frustrations with my coach and his response was, hey, remember when you started? Almost none of your shots went in. And I said, gee, thanks, that makes me feel a lot better. But sarcasm aside, he was right. I'd been so caught up in my current performance, I'd forgotten how far I'd come and I'd forgotten to enjoy myself along the way. What I learned from this first exposure to imposter syndrome is that if you're a perfectionist like me, you'll never be satisfied with where you are, but that doesn't mean you need to beat yourself up over it. Don't forget to step back, look holistically, and acknowledge your strengths and the progress you've made in addition to seeing your weaknesses. Fast forward to 2018, a couple weeks before my master's thesis deadline. I was frantically assembling plots and churning out words when I learned that the startup I'd signed a full-time offer to join after graduating had been acquired by a company called Confluent. That was the first I'd heard of a Pachi Kafka or event streaming, so I was unsurprisingly behind the curve when I started at Confluent a few weeks later. It didn't help that this was before Confluent's first new grad recruiting season, which meant I was the only new grad engineer at the company. It was intimidating to be surrounded by people who knew more and had more experience than me, but it was also an amazing opportunity to learn. I was lucky to have a manager who emphasized the importance of focusing on learning rather than feeling pressure to get things done. He explained it'd be better for both me and the team in the long run if I took things slow and ramped up on solid foundations rather than rushing to get things done with partial understanding. And he couldn't have been more right. So I eventually ramped up and things got better before taking a turn for the worse. Because Confluent was doubling in size each year, that meant when I was less than a year out of school, I'd already been at the company longer than half the other employees and was seen as a veteran, though I definitely didn't feel like one. I felt like tasks that took me weeks could have been done by any of my teammates in a matter of days and found myself working long hours in an attempt to make up for the difference. My manager said I was doing fine and I wanted to believe him, but found it hard to accept. It turns out these thought patterns are common enough to have a name, the imposter cycle. The cycle starts with a task or anything on which our performance may be measured. This triggers worry and typically leads to either procrastination or over-preparation. Once the task has been completed, we reject any praise or positive feedback, dismissing it as luck or something else outside our control, which allows us to repeat the cycle with the next task. To break the cycle, we first need to realize it's happening. In order to stop encouraging thoughts like, what if I disappoint and I just got lucky this time, and instead accept our accomplishments and say, I can do this, knowing that it's okay and totally normal to sometimes slip up. Additionally, the most effective countermeasure in my experience is sharing how I'm feeling with others and realizing I'm not alone. One day during lunch at the office, pre-COVID of course, I ran into a friend on a different team who was a few years older than me. As we caught up, I was amazed to learn she was feeling all the same things I was. Perceived pressure to deliver, even though her manager said, said otherwise, feeling behind her more experienced peers and working longer hours as a result. I couldn't believe someone I so admired and looked up to shared my insecurities. I felt suddenly more okay with myself and was able to break the imposter cycle in doing so. A big part of imposter syndrome is feeling alone, but we can counter that by finding friends, family, and colleagues to serve as personal cheerleaders who we can share our feelings with. Unfortunately, imposter feelings can be hard to talk about since at its heart is the fear that others will realize we're frauds and sharing our insecurities feels like it might contribute to that. 
but personal cheerleaders help overcome this by making us feel safe and not alone. So to recap, overcoming imposter syndrome starts with identifying what's happening. A few weeks ago, I received an email asking whether I'd like to give a lightning talk at the Confluent Girl Geek X event. I was excited, but also a bit apprehensive since I couldn't think of a topic I felt qualified to talk about, particularly to an audience with more industry experience, tech experience, and life experience than me. I fought these doubts by thinking about my strengths and choosing a topic I feel strongly about and reframed my fear of failure as an opportunity to expand my comfort zone and grow. Rather than worrying about audience members being disappointed, I focused on the fact that if my talk helps even a handful of people overcome imposter syndrome, then that's wonderful. And of course, I shared how I felt with my friends and with the event organizers too. Their validation gave me the confidence to be here today, which I'm extremely grateful for since one of the most harmful consequences of imposter syndrome is to cause us to give up opportunities we might otherwise take. That said, while these strategies for beating the imposter are powerful, they also have their limits. If you find yourself in a toxic environment where those around you put you down or belittle you, it's better to address or leave the situation than focus on internal reframing. Additionally, it may be prudent to seek professional help, especially if your physical or mental health are suffering. To sum up, Focus on your own progress and growth rather than comparing yourself to others. Watch out for the perfectionism trap and remember that imposter syndrome is common when starting something new or if you perceive yourself as different from those around you in any way. Acknowledge your strengths in addition to your weaknesses. Reframe intimidation and fear as learning opportunities and chances to grow. Know that it's okay to mess up sometimes. Find personal cheerleaders to talk to you remember you're not alone, and go grab that opportunity you've been wanting to take. Thanks. Thank you, Victoria. That was an excellent talk on imposter syndrome and breaking out of that cycle. We do have a question for you um, from Pooja. She asks, do you think imposter syndrome is mostly seen in women? She relates to this feeling and most boys around her know less but are very confident. So funny that this is asked actually, in digging into this talk, uh, I did look at the academic research and it's pretty split. So earlier studies suggest that imposter feelings are more common with it, in women. Uh, more recent studies are more ambiguous about it. Uh, in terms of my personal experiences, I think for me, it's any time I'm in a situation where I feel like the odd one out. Um, so that could be being in tech in an industry that is male dominated, it makes total sense for women to feel more this way. Um, or in situations where it's hard to point to leaders who, or success stories that kind of look like me. Um, so again, it's depending on the industry, it makes a lot of sense. For sure. I think um, you, you have the example about the tennis and when you played tennis, was it girls tennis? It was girls tennis, yeah. And in that case, the reason I felt different was just because I was new to the sport. Um, it, was, it was definitely an internal feeling rather than my teammates making me feel different or anything like that. And that was enough to trigger it. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. It seems to really have resonated a lot of the girl geeks in the audience. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so Someone asked, would you suggest sharing your feelings with coworkers, managers, or people on your team? And why or why not? I think my metric is uh, just whoever I'm comfortable with. Um, so I have my go-to friends and family members, of course. And if uh, I have friends at the office or people who I can kind of trust to understand where I'm coming from rather than to kind of misinterpret or uh, even worse, accidentally spread information that I wouldn't want to be spread, um, then I find that those are great people to talk to too. Um, so I guess my advice there would be to trust your instincts. I think we tend to have pretty good reads on who's trustworthy and who we want to open up to. And if you think someone's trustworthy, then I'd say give it a shot, um, even though it can be scary to talk about.